Good evening. Welcome to Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021, regular selectmen's meeting. Uh, let's see, I haven't even looked to see who's here for, we have Ken and Noah. Ed. As I don't see Ed up there yet. Uh, he's here. Oh, yep, yeah, yep, there he is, yep. And uh, Mark has uh, been excused tonight, and I am here, so four. We have town manager, town planner, is town finance. finance director, is assessing officer will be with us. Uh, let's see, who else is here? Oh, we have recreation here. And deputy we have a, clerk. Lots of people here. Deputy clerk, uh, Julie. Oh, oh, I didn't even see Julie there. Hey, hey Julie. Is, uh, all right, is, uh, please stand with me and salute the flag. Pledge of allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America to the Republic, Republic for which, which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first order is the approval of the February 9th minutes. I know, Ken, you had a question on one of the articles yes uh, article 15 uh we did the motion for the abatement for the tree growth penalty right and the second motion to approve it uh the minutes have mark as seconding the motion he wasn't there at the time right he had left right so i'm not i think we need to table this because i'm not sure who the actual second was and have patty go back and take a look at it right yeah, right so um all right is uh we have a a motion to table the on the minutes do i have a second second is there no further discussion i'll go through the roll ed yes ken yes noah yes and myself is a yes. So that will be tabled. All right. Um, we have no public comments tonight, as we have no public hearings tonight. Uh, BCTV committee does not have a report. Is Jeremy here? Is he going to give us the report? Yes. I am here. Stand by. Let me start a video here. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hey Jeremy. Uh, so we are uh, we're moving uh, at Envision. We've done uh, a couple of pretty exciting meetings. A lot of it is just uh, um, at the moment still st st excuse me still sort of stirring the pot in the background, trying to find a uh, way to make um, the historical society viable again. Um, and uh, Elise, who's on the on the call with me, uh, she and I had a great meeting with. James and with Steve uh, to talk about uh, branding, sort of uh, as far as the whole town is concerned, as well as signage, uh, future uh, ideas, and and where we were headed, uh, including uh, a discussion I think that will be continued with with you all regarding messaging and uh, and um, the new signage that actually includes messaging. We talked about digital signs versus signs that, that have messaging like like the uh, sandwich boards you guys have now but built in that had already been approved and is being manufactured. So we're, um, we're not only on top of that, but it was anticipated. So now we're, we're, we're um, working on several other proposals uh, with, uh, with the town and uh, in conjunction with Envision, specifically thinking about um, covering um, more components uh, with, with a kind of shared branding and, and vision. Did I say that right, Elise? Like a system. Um, in addition to that, I had a uh, very, very uh, um, elucidating meeting with uh, Pat and Paul regarding the uh, Envision Berwick's mission to uh, preserve the rural nature of the town and uh, what what James has started to head me towards, which is the the um, the strip that that 
potentially will be in some way agriculturally pre protected and bringing, at least as a starting point, the uh, working farms, farmers, or anybody who is, you know, uh, in ag in that corridor uh, together. Um, and even, even um, some of the community members who uh, own that open space so that we can start to figure out the kind of um, Venn diagram of where everybody's interests overlap and, and for Envision to start there in an attempt to, to meet those needs. Uh, that's, I think, the broad sweeping stuff. Uh, I don't know if any of you use social media with any regularity, but I will say that um, Marie Miller and, and um, with, with Elise setting her in motion with uh, templates has done, uh, I think, a really stunning job of taking the social media to a, a whole new place very quickly. And I'm really excited about that, seeing the shout outs and even, you know, with, with um, working with Angela and Rec to come up with, with a, I think, a really gorgeous uh, invitation in a way to, uh, to Easter on March 27th, is it? Is that right? Um, which I think is just a great way to, to start off this um, new look and trying to tie everything together in a, in a very, um, in a lovely and appropriate package. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the, uh, the short, short version. We have obviously our next official meeting for Envision Berwick scheduled on the same night as the, the dual um, meeting with you guys and the um, planning. So we may have, we are hoping to have, if enough people want to attend a sort of sidebar meeting next Tuesday night to try and get some other stuff going because it's a long time before that April meeting. And um, yeah, with that, I think that's uh, that's the broad sweeping envision stuff. Am I forgetting anything, James? Oh, I think that's that's a good summary. There's always more, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's always more with Envision Berwick. We know that. Is you guys you guys uh, just keep moving. Um, any questions of Jeremy from the rest of the board? If not, is uh, thank you, Jeremy. If we look Absolutely. Look Let me just ask, Elise, are, are you? Are, were we going to to pitch anything, or are we are we putting anything out there as it relates to branding, signage, or otherwise tonight? I don't think we have anything to pitch tonight. I am here because I was under the assumption that an agenda item was to swear in new people to Envision Berwick. I don't know if that's happening tonight or next Tuesday or next month. That's happening tonight. Tonight. Okay. Be happening tonight. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Just a few minutes. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Nothing else beyond that for tonight. All right. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Great. I'm going to turn my video off so I don't have to keep using my head to block the unfolded shirt behind me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all right. <clears throat> the we brings us to a uh, featured presentation. Is we have Carl Strohmeyer is uh, presenting for the Great Thicket and Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuges. All right, yeah. Hey, um, thank you for uh, inviting us tonight. And we're really excited about our, um, our presentation. We want to talk a little bit about the establishment of the Great Thicket uh, National Wildlife Refuge in Maine, which just occurred this past um, December. And uh, uh, Berwick and South Berwick are the, the first uh, municipalities in Maine to um, provide a home for this National Wildlife Refuge. So it, it's really a, um, a neat thing and um, have a little presentation uh, prepared and, and I'm going to share the screen now. I'm Carl Strohmeyer, the refuge manager, and uh, Ryan Kleinert, who's our assistant refuge manager, and uh, Kate O'Brien, our lead uh, wildlife biologist, are also here tonight. And we're all gonna present a, a bit about this, uh, this great, great thing. Thank you. <clears throat> yep, uh, can everybody see that? Yes, we can. Great, great. Yep, so, um, so that this is the uh, the topic, and we're just going to uh, kind of start at the beginning with um, who we are and and what we do. 
And we are um, a, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which manages the National Wildlife Refuge System, of which Great Thicket is a part. We are a bureau in the U.S. Department of the Interior, our principal uh, public land management agency. So we are, are one of several bureaus, among them the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the Bureau of Reclamation, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and, and ourselves, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And, and we, um, we manage lands throughout the country. We have different administrative regions. Uh, Maine happens to be in the North Atlantic Appalachian region. Our, for ourselves, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, our mission is, is quite clear. It's a wildlife first mission that promotes human appreciation and use of nature. So we, we manage habitats for the, the wild species and the, the um, conservation values, the ecosystem values, such as clean air, clean water, open spaces. We, we heard earlier um, tonight uh, from about the initiative in Berwick to preserve uh, open open lands and working farms. And um, this is, is very much consistent with Fish and Wildlife Service um, philosophy to have public lands that are both for wildlife habitat and human use. And the Great Thicket uh, National Wildlife Refuge, which has now been established in um, Berwick is one of 565 national wildlife refuges across the country. So this is a, a system of protected lands and uh, many of them uh, were established along uh, flyways. Uh, migratory birds are, are a key feature of the early years of the refuge system establishment. If you look at the East Coast, you, you see a pattern and the, um, we have a central flyway, a Pacific flyway but increasingly these lands are managed for unique assemblages of plants and, and the uses that they permit. And that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. The, the administrative center where we manage the Great Ticket National Wildlife Refuge is located at the Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge in Wells. And the, the Rachel Carson Refuge, which is, is one of four National Wildlife Refuges in Maine, uh, manages lands along 50 miles of coast between uh, Kittery and Cape Elizabeth. And that is uh, that refuge was established in 1966 and renamed in honor of uh, the great conservationist Rachel Carson in 1970. So the, the, the staff uh, managing the Great Thicket are located in Wells and are the same staff that, that work on the Rachel Carson Refuge. And it's it's kind of neat um, talking about things to celebrate during the pandemic. This is the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the Rachel Carson Refuge. So just uh, a shout out for that. But we're here tonight to talk about the, the Great Thicket <coughs> Refuge. And the, the Great Thicket Refuge is is different, of course, uh, for from the Rachel Carson Refuge. Each refuge has uh, purposes, unique purposes for which it was established and enabled uh, by Congress. And the, the purpose of the Great Ticket National Wildlife Refuge is a landscape level uh, conservation effort in six states, New York and five in New England, including New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Maine, to protect uh, shrubland habitats and young forests. This is a habitat type that is uh, dwindling in these states and it's imp a really important habitat and ecosystem for lots of species, which, which we will be hearing about. And the, like all refuges, this refuge has a very um, precise acquisition boundary. The acquisition boundary is an area where we acquire lands for the refuge purposes from willing sellers. And you can see in the, um, on, on the right there, the Berwick York focus area. This, this is the area where the Great Ticket National Wildlife Refuge in Maine is going to have um, many of its lands. There's another uh, area up north in Cape Elizabeth. It's a bit smaller and also in keeping with um, congressional 
uh, mandate and enabling enabling legislation, each refuge can only acquire up to a certain amount of land. And this, um, the Great Thicket National Wildlife Refuge is um, able to acquire up to 2,000 acres of land for conservation purposes in the Berwick York focus area. And, and a really exciting thing about what we do is working with partners. So it's, it's not just about the refuge acquiring land, but it's, it's working with partners. That's the key element of what we do. And uh, Ryan will be talking about that and more specifically about the, um, the refuge itself and our plans for the, the, the parcel we've acquire, acquired in Berwick and South Berwick. This is just a snapshot of our staff. We've got about uh, 10 permanent staff and uh, 20 seasonal staff that come on during the spring and summer. Ryan. Thanks, Carl. Good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Kleinert. I am the Assistant Refuge Manager at Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge. It's nice to meet all of y'all this evening. Um, so this is the newest acquisition um, it, that borders both Berwick and South Berwick. It establishes this great thicket, National Wildlife Refuge in Maine, which we're very excited about. Um, and we're hoping it'll be one of many acquisitions for Great Thicket. Um, this pr property has tremendous conservation value for a variety of species is made up of a matrix of habitat, including mixed northern hardwoods and emergent wetlands. And we do plan to conduct management on this parcel in order to enhance its ecological value for New England cottontail and other species that benefit from an early successional um, scrub shrub habitat. Um, that type of management mostly looks like hand crews going in, thinning the canopy to allow for scrubby, shrubby uh, plant species to grow to make it kind of thick. Um, preferred habitat for the New England cottontail. Kate O'Brien, our refuge biologist, will be speaking to that in a little bit more detail. Um, we were excited to learn that Knight's Pond has access and is popular with anglers. Um, so that was a big plus when we uh, acquired this property. Carl, you can go to the next slide. Wildlife conservation is our primary mission, uh, but compatible wildlife dependent recreation is something that we encourage and emphasize. Um, we want the community to engage and experience and connect with the refuge. Listed here are six big recreational uses. Um, these six are supported and highlighted throughout the refuge and not just the refuge, the entire refuge system adopts these six as priority um, activities. Um, they include hunting, fishing, wildlife observation, photography, environmental education, interpretation. Um, opportunities to pursue these activities throughout the Rachel Carson Refuge. And um, hopefully, you know, as we acquire more property, the Great Thicket National Wildlife Refuge, um, you know, it's something we value very, very much so. So opportunities for each of these activities exist throughout each of our divisions um, across Rachel Carson. Carl, you can go to the next slide. We are a coastal refuge. Um, and uh, we have a robust, robust fishing program. Many of the area, many of um, areas, there are many areas accessible for the public. Um, each management division of Rachel Carson has access to fishing sites. Um, obviously, striped bass is one of the preferred flagship species and is of interest of many anglers. That's actually uh, uh, um, Sean Campbell, our maintenance worker, highlighting one of his uh, striped uh, bass catches. That's probably, I don't know, let's say maybe 31, 32 inches, at least 30 inches. Um, Carl, you can go to the next slide. Partnerships are essential to everything we do. Um, the refuge spans 50 miles across the coast um, and includes over you know, 14 municipalities, uh, provides us with a great opportunity to engage partners. Um, we strive for a community-based conservation approach to actualize meaningful stewardship on the land. And some of our partners include um, nonprofits such as Maine Audubon, the Nature Conservancy, Saco Bay Trails, um, to either provide um, wildlife um, management or protection or to enhance public use like Saco Bay Trails. Help, um, we have partnered with them to increase um, our ability to provide uh, quality hiking trails to the public. Um, of course, we work very closely with each of the town managers and municipalities and all of our adjacent landowners are very much so value partners. Our, one of our claim to fame is that out of all the refuges, we, we po quite possibly have more uh, private land, adjacent private landowners than any other refuge. So we, uh, we, um, we work with adjacent landowners very, very closely. Can you go to the next slide? 
We want people to come to the refuge to experience different habitats and to learn about conservation, biodiversity, stewardship, and the work that we do. We host school groups throughout the spring and some camps throughout the summer. Um, we offer weekly environmental education programs throughout the summer months. Hopefully we'll get back to that this summer. Of course, we had to take a break this past summer due to COVID. Um, we have plans to increase our public offerings as we continue to grow our volunteer services program. On staff, we also have a federal wildlife officer, Zach Ostegi. Um, his primary, primary function is pri uh, public safety. His work is very similar to state uh, game wardens, um, focused on public safety and wildlife habitat protection. He's often the first person our recreational users have an opportunity to meet and valued member of our team. So if you see him out in the public, feel free to say hi. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kate O'Brien, our senior wildlife biologist. Great. Hi. Um, thanks for meeting us tonight. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the um, the wildlife of the uh, National Wildlife Refuge System and a little bit about um, how we approach wildlife. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service, as Carl had mentioned earlier, we generally will manage migratory bird species, species that move across state lines that are hard to manage for any one particular state. So migratory birds, um, threatened and endangered species, um, and then a whole collection of other wildlife that occur on our lands. Um, next slide. Um, the two species I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, actually I forgot the species before that was the salt marsh sparrow, which is a salt marsh obligate species. Not something we're going to talk about tonight, but that's another story. Um, the two species I'm going to talk about is the New England cottontail rabbit and also um, Blanding's turtles just a little bit. And these two species illustrate um, a new approach that Fish and Wildlife Service is taking with our partners to try to work with rare species to stop them from needing to be uh, have any additional regulatory protections. So we call it the at-risk species program. And our, our goal here is to make sure that these species do well um, through time and don't require uh, additional regulatory protections. So Great Thicket is a big part of, um, of what that looks like for these two critters. Um, next slide. So um, the new cottontail in Maine is, is a, probably one of my favorite species. Um, it's, it's a little bit of an interesting story. Um, it used to be extremely common, very, very common, especially after the 1947 fires swept through Maine um, and as some of our ag land reverted to shrublands. It was very, very common species, commonly hunted, commonly seen. Um, but as our shrublands grew to forests, as we drained and ditched some of our naturally occurring shrublands, um, we just really tended to lose the species quite a bit. We used to have it in about 24 towns in, in Maine in the early 2000s, and now they're known from six. Our knowledge is certainly incomplete, um, it, being that it likes to live in a really thick, uh, tangled underbrush. It's a species that can be hard to detect. It's a species that can be hard to see unless you're hanging around the edge of a shrubland at dawn. Um, so we don't have perfect information and we'd love to hear if people see a brown rabbit in winter or a little cottontail rabbit here in Maine. Um, but all of our signs are pointing to a continuing decline. Um, within the global world of New England cottontail, Maine has about 17% of the known occupied sites. And another kind of interesting thing with um, with New England cottontail is there's a non-native species called Eastern cottontail that looks very, very similar. That's really common. You know, it's the rabbit you might see hopping around Prescott Park in Portsmouth. Um, it's fairly common in New Hampshire, very common in Massachusetts, and it doesn't seem to really get along with New England cottontail. Maine is home to about 50% of our New England cottontail only patches. And in many other patches, we have both Eastern Cottontail and New England Cottontail in the same landscape, and that doesn't work out very well. Um, the property that we're talking about today that we've just acquired is within hopping distance of historic Cottontail sites. Um, and uh, your neighbors, Rawlingsford, New Hampshire, is also managing New England Cottontail, and they're seeing some good success with bringing those rabbits back. So um, we are confident that if they're not, not right there on the property, that they're certainly within um, hopping distance. They use those power lines and the railway and other shrubby areas to get around. Um, but we certainly would like to hear from you if you do see them. Um, next, next slide. So 
what we've been doing for many years now is, is that we've been working with partners. We've been asking people um, to join us in helping manage habitat to help conserve the mineral cottontail. Habitat management can be simple as like uh, a shrubby edgeland, a feathered edge for a forest, working with agricultural lands, uh, managing some of those lands that, that are not in production. Um, these rabbits are not purists. They're not, um, they do pretty well in human landscapes as long as they have that thick cover understory. Um, some people in Berwick might be hearing from our New England Cottontail Conservation Coordinator, Jeff Tash, who actually lives in Berwick. Um, he'll start reaching out to some select few landowners uh, within the next several weeks to, um, to see what their level of interest is in managing for New England cottontail and troubling species. This is um, definitely an um, initiative that's uh, range wide and um, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's been pretty successful and the great thicket is a huge part of it for us. Next slide. And you know, when we're talking about animal cottontail rabbits, um, we're not talking about single species management. He might be the umbrella uh, species that protects all these other species, both common and rare. So from everything from American woodcock, white-tailed deer, um, towhees, there's all these critters that rely on this kind of shrubby habitat that um, we've really lost over the years. So when we work to preserve animal cottontail rabbits and we work to have lands in the great thicket, we're protecting a whole bunch of other species. And so next slide, uh, that brings us to, um, you know, we want to hear from you. What questions do you have for us? Thank you for the presentation. Um, any questions from any of the board members? I don't hear any. Um, I, I have a couple questions if you have time. Is um, What's the total acreage of the Great Thicket in Berwick and South Berwick? It's um, it's 47 acres and about seven acres are in Berwick and about 40 acres are in South Berwick. Yep. Um, are you looking to add more, you no know, contiguous acreage? Are you are you talking to the landowners in the area to see if they want to you know donate or sell any more land or how are you going about that process? We, we did issue a press release about the, um, the Great Thicket National Wildlife Refuge back in uh, January. And we, of course, we, our policy is that we only acquire land from willing sellers. So we, we are starting to do outreach in, of certain types. Kate mentioned um, Jeff Tash, who is the New England Cottontail uh, Landscape Coordinator, and, and he is reaching out to landowners to um, to form partnerships. So we're, we're kind of starting to, to roll out a, a strategy, but we, um, as, as Ryan pointed out, we work with partners. So we, we're, we're very much about working with land trusts and other land management agencies or organizations and, and the towns themselves to, to manage uh, the lands and, and link, ideally, the parcels we acquire would help link uh, pre-existing conservation lands. We're also working very, very closely with uh, the Maine Inland Department of uh, Fisheries and Wildlife. We work together on a daily basis. So um, some people may have been in contact with Corey Stearns about you know, cottontail surveys or land management, but, but we're, um, we're a good team. What kind of educational programs are you offering uh, for uh, uh, bird watching and things like that. Is that something that will take place in the thicket? Oh, oh, yeah, thanks, that's a great question. Hopefully, as we acquire more properties and if they're publicly accessible, we would like to bring you know some, some of our interns over the summer host walks, interpretive walks about native plants or songbirds. Um, so have an opportunity to, to expand it to different parts of of the state of Southern Maine, but the refuge would be ideal. So as we get more properties and, as, and if they're publicly accessible, and of course we're gonna to try to make them. So um, yeah, that would that's a goal of ours for sure. Good, thank you. Yeah, because one of, one of the things that Berwick is working on is, is we have a new recreation director and uh, we have quite a few walking trails in Berwick now. So we're, that's one of the things we're looking to expand on. We're looking for partners, you know, to do things like that. You know, so that we can have better opportunities. So, 
Can I just say something? Sure. <laughs> I'm Angela. I'm the new recreation director. Um, I would love to partner with you guys to when you guys establish those programs so we can help you guys get people in. Um, with Great Works Land Trust right now, we have their stuff on our website. So any kind of partnership that we can do to provide um, information and education to the community, I'm more than happy to help. Awesome. It, it, the other thing too is Kyle, Kyle knows he's he's already talked to our uh, director for our public television station. You know any any kind of video or anything that you guys have that you want to put out there, just get in contact with Terry at BCTV, and um, she's always looking for something to put on air. So as, if you have you know anything from something a couple minutes long to a half hour or so long. Is I'm sure she would be uh, more than willing to put that up on our station for you. So, um, I, I just want one other thing is um, I know is my family in the past has worked with the uh, the the uh, National Resource you know, Council to uh, get our uh, family land harvested and and stuff. I know that there's a program of them, you know, creating cottontail habit. And I know of at least one place in Berwick, you no, know, probably about three miles as a crow flies from the thicket, where they did that just a year or so ago. I think they cleared, I don't know if it's 10 acres of scrubland. So um, is, are you guys aware of any, all of that that's going on in the area? Yep, we've been working with NRCS um, uh, as well, there's a, and um, well, we were working closely with one of their staff members who's actually moved on to a different job, but we are in touch with the NRCS and we're trying to connect landowners with those programs as well. So um, we're starting to roll out our next phase of outreach and NRCS will be a really important um, partner in that as are their wildlife programs. All right, um, any questions from the rest of the board or any of the other participants that may still be hanging in? If not, as I, I thank you for the presentation. That was great. Thank you. As, um, like I said, is, is you, you found a willing partner here in Berwick, and uh, is, we're looking forward to uh, you know, continuing this, this relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank, thank you very you. much. Yep. All right. That moves us on to James Bellissimo. And warrants for the June 8th meet, town meeting. All right. Go with the easy one first. Um, food sovereignty ordinance, what this does, it allows folks, uh, farmers, local producers, to produce food at their home and to be able to sell it directly to patrons without having, uh, without needing. Um, I think the writers of this ordinance would say uh, excessive licensing to be able to do that out of their home. That's really that's really all it does. It doesn't affect anything that goes to actual markets, um, and it doesn't apply to meat or uh, poultry, but for jams, uh, milk, and like pickled things, that's 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 what it applies to. Um, are there any questions on that? Are they required to to uh, report to the Department of Health and go through all kinds of inspections and things like that, or is it on a small enough scale? Small enough scale. So this allows them to circumvent that. Okay. Good. And it's the it's actually a a statute that was adopted by the Maine Legislature about five or six years ago. Okay. Right. It's a small but important step. It, that it, it is the the. The reason behind it was, was there were some some municipalities that were looking to uh, you know put licensing requirements on people like with uh, roadside stands and farmers markets and things like that, and uh, you know rather than get into the excessive bureaucracy, you know for small scale things is is uh, they passed this as James said a couple sessions ago I believe is what it was. That's food sovereignty. Um, the next thing, we have a, a zoning amendment that was proposed by um, Pond Road and Perry's Way. It ended up being one, two, three, four, so five lots 
out there where it's it's off route four. So instead of it being a rural commercial industrial zone, the proposal is for it to be rural residential. Um, and it's this type of rezoning is something that we've been talking about with comprehensive planning because um, I think I think creating these nice clean lines you can see on our zoning map just doesn't really match up to to reality where I mean you get off route four gets pretty um, looks into farmland open space pretty quickly. Um, so the the main difference between R3 and RCI, uh, I make a point that every every zone has commercial uses. It's just a spectrum. RCI allows for transfer stations, metal recycling, um, industries, where rural residential is mostly, it's mostly for farmland open spaces. Any questions of James on that one? No, James, is this, this was this was mostly driven, I think, by the uh, marijuana proposal out there. Yeah. You no, know, where you know we had that, you no, know, found out that loophole where you know we thought everything was on Route Four, but it wasn't. Right. So, so basically, this is you know taking the residential people and putting them back in a residential neighborhood. Right. So. Right. I mean, we look at the RCI zone as I mean, it's for we're trying to get property taxes and and have everything where we're utilizing Route Four for you know the heavier uses. And last and not least, or oops, not this one, I already did this one. All right, last and not least, our land use ordinance amendments. I'll go over, um, I went over these probably three or four times with planning board. I'll try not to bore you guys. Let's see, um, so what's going on here is this, this is amending and simplifying the definitions of, of frontage you'll see that there's things that are crossed out that's being proposed to be deleted. And anything in yellow highlight, red and underlined is, is new language. So what's happening here, what's, what's happened with Jen and I in the planning and code office is we get a ton of questions, probably one or two a week when we're um, you know, in the busy, busy season about what this means. I think what this does is it helps, helps us administer what it's saying easier and it makes it more accessible for the general public. So, it, so what happened here is there's a definition inside of a definition, which ends up contradicting 7.21 later on. So what this is, every lot needs frontage and you can bring in your own right of way to get frontage off, um, off that right of way. And what you need for, if you have one house off a of right of way, it has to be 12 feet wide, 15 inches of gravel. And there's also stipulations that culverts and ditches need to be um, installed at appropriate points. This just takes a pretty, I mean, if there's a, just a paragraph block of text. You, you can get lost pretty easily trying to read what that means. Table makes it much simpler. So this doesn't change anything. It just takes a paragraph, puts it into a table. Um, and the, the uh, other thing that it does is that it specifies that um, the mechanism for determining the appropriate points is determined by an engineer or the town. And then uh, all this cross out here uh, is getting rid of, um, it's, it's, it's um, redundant language. There's a whole, pretty much a page that applies to a very specific uh, scenario for lots that are created before 1987 on town discontinued roads. There's probably three or four town discontinued roads. Again, the, the, the deleting it all doesn't effectively change anything. It's just, uh, it gets rid of redundant language and rephrases it in a more concise way. So, so everything that's being deleted is stated in another section yeah. in a more concise way. Right. Yeah. It says they they can get um, they can put a house on a town discontinued road and you get a second house if you give it to a kid as long as it meets uh, road standards. With All right. Yeah, I remember road. those. Yeah. So um, number three, uh, marijuana amendments. So this this closes that. Uh, Tom called it like the loophole that I think the probably the intent was to restrict uh, on 
RCI on the major highways. So that puts that in there. Uh, the next one about establishments under ownership on non-contiguous lots. So that would make, even if the same marijuana business were under the same ownership, the setback would apply if they weren't on lots that were touching each other. So that way they couldn't cross the street. They'd still have to meet the thousand foot setback. Um, the next two here on the other line that exempts uh, marijuana testing facilities. Marijuana testing facilities have um, potential for high uh, personal property, high property taxes if it's a new building, and it's a fairly low security compared to the other marijuana uses. And it just would be, it would finish a marijuana cluster. Um, changes four through seven are very minuscule, pretty much either typo things or very small clarifications. Um, I don't really, I don't, like getting rid of person because it's already defined, clarifying that they have to be uh, set back from any well, any well, and then uh, clarifying and getting rid of the type of screening needed for a garbage disposal um, for a trash bin and um, and then changing the sawmill horsepower from 30 to 50. Um, we had that where it's, you know, it's, it's an arbitrary number, but I think 50 is probably more appropriate for where we're at. Are there any, any questions on that? I know I've kind of blew through that, but. I think they're all pretty self-explanatory. So the last one, um, last one and probably the most, this is the most important one and the most <laughs> impactful one. This is for the village overlay district. And it's, uh, a, it's a provision to allow exceeding the max footprint size, as long as it's not for a non-commercial, a non-residential use on that first floor. So the building can exceed 15,000 square feet as long as the first floor is used for commercial, manufacturing, manufacturing, recreation, or parking. Um, and that's, um, Great Falls Construction has indicated they are interested in putting in a, uh, a, a all commercial first floor building. And it would, uh, the way that the 15,000 square foot maximum, it would limit what they wanna do. And I think that would just, it flies in the face of what we're trying to do downtown. Also, I'll make a note that um, there is a group that's interested in putting in a 21,000 square foot recreational facility as well in the village overlay district. And that's just something that, again, I don't think we wanna restrict that either. So that, I think that's the end of my, uh, my spiel for tonight. Any questions for James? It doesn't appear. All right, thank you, James. It'll bring us to our appointments to the Envision Berwick Committee. As we have three here, we have Kevin Jessel, Cyrus Morgan, and Elise Weeks. Um, we'll take them up one at a time. Um, I know Kevin has been on before. He's been on the board. I don't know if he is he up there. I don't think he's attending. I don't see Kevin or, or Cyrus. Nope. But, nope. Um, but um, James, if you want to speak up for Kevin. And sure. Yeah. Kevin is a, a paramedic and um, he lives in lives in town and he was uh, he had uh, baby number two and he said he had to sign off for a little bit, but now baby two isn't so small. So now he's back and, and looking to get involved in uh, this new and exciting iteration of Envision Berwick. So is, uh, yeah, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin came on a couple of years ago. I'd met him then. Um, is, uh, it seems like he had a lot of good ideas and a lot of energy. So um, he would be appointed for a term ending December 31st in 2022. Any questions? If not, I'll take a motion to accept. So moved. Well, we have a motion. Second. And a second. Um, any further discussion? If not, I'll go through the roll. Ed? Yes. Ken? Yes. Noah? Yes. And myself is yes. Thank you. So next we have, it's listed as Morgan Cyrus, but James informs me that it's Cyrus Morgan. <laughs> is, uh, 
I don't, I don't see Cyrus up there either. Can... I probably got the Zoom link to him too too late. But, yeah. I mean, Cyrus, um, he's been involved for a few months. He's He's got great ideas. I think he's – He's a, he's somebody that I think provides a lot of constructive feedback. We have a lot of grandiose ideas, but I think Cyrus is a real uh, a doer, and it's nice to have it's nice to have both. And uh, just as an example, he's already volunteered to help um, uh, help with Penny Pond. We have some some areas that have been kind of degrading, and he's already stepped up to the plate and get it done. Any questions about Cyrus? If not, I'm looking for a motion to appoint. His term would also end December 31st in 2022. Removed. I have a motion and a second. There's no further discussion. I'll go through the roll. It was Ed? Yes. Ken? Yes. Noah? Yes. And myself is a yes. And Elise, Elise is here. She can talk to herself. <laughs> hey, Elise, how you doing? Hi, good. How are you? Not too bad. Good. Um, well, I'm excited to join in Vision Berwick. Um, I was first brought into um, the mix for, with Serena, who invited me to um, develop the branding for the town, which we've done. And I just, I live here, I work here, I work from home, um, I have a graphic design business, and I'm just really excited about what's going on here in town. Um, I'm excited to continue with the brand rollout and helping sort of in any way that I can in the ways that I can. Um, some of this will happen in my professional capacity uh, through, you know, I have contracts with the town to do design work, but I do donate quite a bit of my time and volunteer for some things as far as like kind of lending any expertise I have around developing like marketing plans. And I know Jeremy has tons of ideas um, for what is going to happen with Envision Berwick's and, you know, kind of making a more cohesive system um, for the various departments in town. So, you know, I'm kind of helping to execute all of that stuff and just um, I'm interested in, you know, other things that are happening with some of the other committees that have kind of become defunct over the years, um, the arts committee, I have a young daughter who's in elementary school here so I'm super interested in what's going on with the rec department. Um, and just, you know, obviously preserving spaces and farmland and all of that and, you know, I think I really got involved in the summer, um, James working with James on the lawn chairs, the brand launch and the lawn chairs event I think that's probably where a lot of my efforts may also come into play is when we kind of pick all of that back up again, because I just really enjoyed that process and we got a lot done in a little bit of time. And um, yeah, so I could go on and on, but yeah, I'm just kind of excited to kind of bring my design marketing brain and um, working with Marie and Jeremy on kind of getting the social media ramped up that's already kind of happening and um, just kind of putting a whole plan and process around communications, campaigns, things like that, that we want to do here in Berwick. So there's lots to do and I'm hoping I can rope my husband into all of this as well. So <laughs> <laughs> now that you said it publicly, he has to, right? Yeah. Well, he's good with tools. He's a handy dude. So I know there's lots of trails that need help and things like that. So yeah, he was pretty helpful when we were doing lawn chairs with signage and things like that. So any questions of Elise? I, I do know that I, you know, I really like the the branding that you rolled out. Is I, I like the simplicity of the design, and but it's rather unique also. And and I also like the colors. You know, is uh, those are my favorite. But um, if there are no other questions, is um, we take a motion to appoint Elise to the Envision Berwick. It says here that her term would be December thirty first, two thousand and twenty one. Is that correct, James? Do you know? Uh, 22. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought it was 22. Yeah, so 2022. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. No further discussion. We'll go through the roll. Is Ed? Yes. Ken? Yes. Noah? Yes. And myself is a yes. Thank you. Congratulations.
everyone. As we look forward to seeing all your good work. So now we have an appointment to the planning board. This is Paul Amatucci for a term ending December 31st, 2023. Is this for a full yeah, this, so David Ross Lyons uh, issued his resignation a couple weeks ago. David was part of the planning board for a couple of years. Um, he did. He, he was uh, appreciated his time, and and Paul's volunteer to step up. Um, so he's. We typically we take whoever is on the reserve and move them up. The alternate. Do we? We have two alternates already, don't we? I was thinking just because it's all been so recent, instead of juggling all the positions and do the swearing in, that Paul fills in the regular member. I don't, based off of what Phil, Phil was the alternate and Amber was the alternate, it seemed like they're, they're okay with being. Yeah, alternate. they just came in two weeks ago, right? Yeah, I don't, I, there's not <laughs> so, much yet. Not much room for the seniority part. No. Uh, Paul, I mean, Paul, you're. I was going to say, Paul is here. Let's hear from Paul. Is uh, Introduce yourself, Paul. And, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm Paul Amatucci. I'm, I'm uh, a resident of Berwick, of course. Uh, and really, my my interest in doing this is that for me, it's time to get back. Uh, I've been attending planning board meetings on a fairly regular basis, as James can attest to, uh, for about a year now. And I understand how how the board works, I understand it's important role for all of us who reside in the town. Um, I have a strong interest in Berwick and a desire to help with its growth, uh, but at the same time preserving our unique heritage and historical significance. Uh, my current position is in the mortgage industry and I manage construction and renovation lending nationally for my company. Uh, it gives me a good background for the planning board and looking at many of the projects that uh, that will come before it. So, uh, so I think that's a helpful uh, attribute to have. The other thing is that, um, you know, I'm, I'm also a member and uh, currently second vice commander of the Berwick American Legion post. Uh, and being involved in all our many activities for the benefit of the community, which I love to do. Uh, I want to continue to be part of Berwick and a positive contributing factor and a real member of this town. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for me. Uh, I would not take it lightly and it would be an honor to serve. Oh, thank you. Um, any questions from the board for Paul? Uh, it doesn't, doesn't appear to be. Um, is, um, I, I will ask the rest of the board is, though, is, as we said, is um, we're looking at, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about putting Paul in as a, a full-time regular. We just appointed two alternates. And like I said, typically we would move an alternate up, but is um, they've had what one meeting under their belt so far? Yeah. Um, um, I don't know. It, I have no objection to putting Paul in as a full-time regular planning board member. I don't know how the rest of the board feels. If you could weigh in. I have no objection. I, I mean, uh, if uh, have you heard anything from the alternates, James? We might. I, might I know they're happy to be to serve, and um, it's just. The ability, it, it's it's so rare that things get voted down that like as an alternate member, you have almost equal say. I mean, every, everyone has the opportunity to speak, ask questions, so. And, and typically at least uh, every meeting, at least one alternate yeah. is a voting member. Right, exactly. And that's, you know, yeah, So yeah. It, it's not like, you know, you're getting left out, so is. Um... Yeah, if we're not violating any policy, then then not, I have no objection to appointing Paul into the position. Ken and Noah, your thoughts? Oh, like Ed said, it, as long as there's nothing out there that says the alternate has mm -hmm. to move up and be refilled, then I have no objection. 
Yeah. His background is really strong compared to your alternates too. Yeah. So is uh no is is that is I don't believe we have any no written policy. It's been more just tradition to do that. But like I said, it's typically you have an alternate that's been serving on the board for a year or more. You know, and typically we just you know move them up where is as I said, you know, every it's been such a big turnover unfortunately lately that um it doesn't seem to be that big a thing. So um all right, if so as I will uh look for a, a motion to appoint Paul Amatucci to a regular planning board position with a term ending December thirty first, two thousand and twenty three. So moved. A motion. Second. And a second. There's no further discussion. I'll go through the roll. Ed? Yes. Ken? Yes. Noah? Yes. And myself is a yes. Congratulations, Paul, and uh, we look forward to your good work. Welcome aboard. So, Thank you a lot. All right. That brings us to our unfinished business. Fire station. We we talked earlier. I, I brought it up that CMP was interested in uh, renting the building uh, for the winter months. The old fire station and it's sitting empty. Uh, did had some stuff in there from Public Works, but we moved this, most of it out. Um, they're willing to pay a thousand. I told them a thousand dollars a month. That more than covers our cost of lighting and heating. Um, so. Uh, they provided all the right liability insurance and uh, with CMP, it's not too difficult. So yeah. uh, uh, just let people know who who is in there and what's going on. They'll only be there three or four months and um, they're having some major renovation work done in one of their garages uh, where they normally are. So uh, we're providing a home from them and they're paying the cost. So. All right. All right. So that's an update where we are. Good tenants. Yeah. <laughs> Low maintenance. Low maintenance, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So and then we have the town hall hour change proposal. Unfortunately, Patty's sick, so she's not here. Um, James has got some data for us. Yeah, I'm a big data nerd, so if I knew there there's me spreadsheets involved, I volunteered <laughs> to help Patty. I've had some conversations with her too. Um, so I'll jump right into it. Uh, so this is a graph showing the, uh, this is total transactions by time. And there's a few things that are shifting here where you remember we changed our hours halfway through the year. So um, we opened 8.30 to nine for from, from J January to July 1st, basically. And then from that point on, we're open from eight to nine. And then we're open two nights a week, five to six, just same deal. Um, we went from two nights a week to one night a week. So that's when you see um, the transactions by time. It switches a lot, um, as you can see, a lot a lot more on the eight to nine and then a lot less for five to six. Makes sense because you're open one day less a week. Also, I think pandemic times, there's a lot of, it's just like, the afternoon is all is all different, so it's 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 interesting to think of how the, the pandemic might have affected this as well. And uh, I think this is the meat of it, where it shows this is uh, not just it's not transactions, but it's the number of people on average. And this is a three day sample that was picked for 2021. Um, you can see it, there's actually a busy time where there's 23 customers from 11 to 12, and then it kind of this is a, a kind of the average pattern. And um, again, these are, these are actually people that are coming in to do transactions. You can see from five to six, uh, there's five customers. So what Patty um, is proposing, I'm proposing on her behalf tonight, is uh, right now the hours eight to four, eight to six, eight to four, eight to four, eight to 1230. And we're closed from uh, 230 to 245 every day, Monday through Thursday to run reports. And the uh, proposal as of March 1st would be open uh, 5.30 p.m. Monday and Wednesday, and then on an open uh, Tuesday, Thursday at five, till five and be closed on Friday. Uh, I think if, if you go back, go back to here, 
it's about it's about most of the transactions that are happening from five to six are happening in that five to five thirty window. And that's um, yeah, that's it. Any questions on the proposal? Steve, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. I know that uh, after four o'clock, the state shuts down. So if anybody comes in after that, and there's a question that has to be answered from the state, or they have to get special permission from the state to do the registration, they have to go turn away and get come back during regular working hours for the state. So I don't see a problem, uh, the five to six time frame really being a big issue for those people that don't think about it and have to get a state question answered because they got to come back anyways. I also think that we've seen an increase in being things done remotely. You know, if you're registering a car uh, with this pandemic, mm -hmm. it's been such that people don't want to come into the town office. They can do everything online with rapid renewal. Uh, they can also do their fishing license, hunting licenses online as well. So uh, an awful lot of work being done remotely, especially since the pandemic. Any other questions or comment from the board? Uh, I will ask one additional question. Of those hours, James, do you know from Patty, or maybe Julie can answer, were those meant to be uh, office open for business till those hours or? Yes. Uh, yep. Okay, yeah. so that's a little different than what we had before. Had so this or, is, so this, before. Yep. So this is um, op these are the the town hall hours, and then these are the staff hours. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Was the staff hours? Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for uh, doing that, James. I think it's important that we conveyed that information to to the public, and and I think that extra half hour um, will be beneficial. Uh, to those who may find it difficult to get there during a certain time frame during the day, but I think it allows them uh, a little more leeway. So uh, I think that's important. But, uh, so th yeah, thank you for the presentation. Happy to do it. Like I said, I, would, I, I get more enjoyment out of it than I should. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, you know, you the, the, you no, know, the proposal is open later than five. You no, know, because they're you know even though the state may shut down, there are there are town issues that people need to take care of, and uh, you know is having those two nights open that late. You know, I, I think that uh, would be more than appropriate. Um, if there are no further questions, is I'd entertain a motion to approve the new hours as presented. So moved. I'll well, second. second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I, I do have one question that popped up right after I made the motion. Uh, when will these hours take effect? March 1st, was it? March 1st. Yep. March 1st, I think, is when they have it listed as. Okay. Is, um, all right. Um, I'll go through the roll. Is Ed? Yes. Ed? Yes. <laughs> Ken? Yes. Noah? Yes. And myself is yes for nothing. Thank you. Town manager report. I don't have very much tonight. Um, it's mostly budget, 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 and we're getting through that. And we'll hopefully finish up tonight. Um, we did renew our contract with Stewart uh, Ambulance Service. We've been working with them for quite a number of years. It changed hands once in between all this. Uh, so Paul, uh, wanted, we wanted to update the contract and have it steward ambulance. Um, and we have an option for, it's a four year contract with the option to uh, extend it even longer. The nice part about this, it doesn't cost us any money. It's a, it's a great service. They, they do a great job for the community. Um, and, and so I signed that contract, Dennis, uh, Chief Plant and I have talked about it before, and uh, we're very happy with what they're doing. And in between, their, uh, I think their response time dropped down. Uh, I was very concerned about that, but uh, once Stewart Ambulance took over, things went right back to where they were uh, in good service. Um, Wright Pierce, um, I don't think I brought this up before. Uh, 
I signed a uh, contract with them. They will start talking to uh, landowners on five or six different properties who said that they could have permission to uh, look at their site for aquifers and see if they can get the uh, volume and quality of the water source. Uh, that will all start officially in uh, as soon as the ground thaws, uh, they said April, and they should be able to finish up what they need to do by June. Uh, and then hopefully on June 8th, uh, when we go to, on the Warren article, we'll get approval uh, to have bar, you know, borrow the 1.2 million. We will be sending out notices and all of the water users that they, about the uh, ballot question. Um, I know we've had complaints ever since I've been here and I think it goes even longer than that. Uh, this is an opportunity to make them upgrade our water uh, system uh, and improve the water quality. And uh, Jody's doing a great job working with them and, and the staff. So um, that's all I have for now. Hmm? Any questions of Steve? Well, if not, we'll move on. As, uh, <clears throat> let's see. I have nothing under Selectman's communications as I'll go to the account payable. We have a payroll warrant number 51 for February 18th, 2021 for the amount of $69,616.15. Account payable warrant 53 for February 23rd, 2021. This was one with the school budget in it. The amount of $1,098,408.99. And a payroll warrant number 52 for February 25th, 2021, the amount of $73,481.16. I'll make a motion we pay the bills. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. No further discussion. I'll go through the roll. Ed? Yes. Ken? Yes. Noah? Yes. And myself is yes. All right. And the new business, that time of the year to start posting roads again. It's that time of year. Uh, is uh, Whether like today, I wonder if the frost is going to come out of the ground a little bit quicker, but yeah. up, uh, I'll go through them. Yeah, just go through it, the names. It, uh, it says, beginning around the end of February, the following road will be posted for weights over 23,000 23, pounds and will remain closed until further notice. Pine Hill Road from Sullivan Street to Messengers Bridge, Little, Ro Little River Road from Messengers Bridge to the North Borough Town Line, Long Swamp Road from Little River Road to the Lebanon Town Line, Cranberry Meadow Road from Pine Hill Road to Old Sanford Road, Old Sanford Road from Cranberry Meadow Road to the North Borough Town Line, Diamond Hill from Old Sanford Road to the Little River Road, the Wentworth Road from School Street to Old Route 4, Blackberry Hill Road from Berwick Road to Portland Street, Guinea Road from Blackberry Hill Road to School Street, and Old Pine Hill Road North from School Street to Pine Hill Road. So, is, um, need a motion? Yeah. Um, can I have a motion to uh, post those roads? So moved. A motion and a second. second. No further second. discussion. No further discussion. I'll go through the roll. Is Ed? Yes. Ken? Yes. Noah? Yes. And myself is a yes. Four, zero. So now we have quick claim deeds and installment contracts. And Karen, are you with us? That would be. Uh, I'm here. Oh, Lisa. Oh, quick clean deed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we'll skip over you just for a second, Karen. Okay, no problem. <laughs> is uh the quick claim deed is Lisa Vargas. If you could explain this to us just briefly, if you could. On February 8th, we took possession of the property. It's land only um, by foreclosure, and the gentleman called a few days later and offered to pay the bill in full to get the land back. So with Steve's per permission, 
we accepted the payment and um, and quit claim the deed, uh, the land back to him. All right. Any questions of Lisa? If not, I'll entertain a motion to accept as presented. So moved. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. No further discussion. I'll go through the roll. Is Ed? Yes. Ken? Yes. Noah? Yes. And myself is a yes. Thank you, Lisa. Now we'll get into the abatements. Jump the Thank you. Um, today, tonight we only have one abatement. Um, this is for a property uh, located at 49 Thompson Hill Road. Um, it's a single family home. The uh, property owner called um, us in, to inform us that the dimensions shown on the sketch of his home on the property card were not accurate. So we went out. We went out. What's that? Uh, so we went out to the property and, and measured it and we corrected the dimensions. Um, as a result of this correction, the assessed value was reduced by 31,500 from 496,300 to 464,800. And so we are recommending that an abatement be granted in the amount of $609.84. So moved. We have a motion. Second. We have a second. We have a motion and a second. There is no further discussion. I'll go through the roll. Is Ed? Yes. Ken? Yes. Noah? Yes. And myself is a yes. A four zero. Thank you. The next item that we have uh, for tonight is a tree growth penalty. Uh, this is for the property located at uh, 15 Saddle Hill Road. Um, we received a written request from the property owners, Allison and Michelle Turner on February 3rd. Um, they requested that two acres be removed from tree growth classification. They also um, updated their application to reflect this change. Um, so as a result of this request, we've removed two acres from classification as, as tree growth, and it will now be assessed in accordance to market value. And a tree growth penalty must therefore be assessed uh, pursuant to the tree growth law. Um, and I provided that calculation on the, on the second page. Uh, the, uh, this calculation is also shared with the property owners and they, uh, they agreed that that was the correct calculation for the tree growth penalty. Um, therefore, it's recommended that the select board approve the tree growth penalty in the amount of $1,020. So moved. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? If not, I'll go through the roll. Is Ed? Yes. Ken? Yes. Noah? Yes. And myself is a yes. Thank you, Karen. Have a good evening. Have a good Thank you. Have a good night. All right. We have no second public comment. We have no executive session. Does anybody have any other business and non-agenda items to bring up? No. Um, all right, is we will be adjourning our regular meeting and going right into our budget workshop. So is I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. A second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right, thank you everybody. <laughs> and we will take a couple of seconds here and get our paperwork straightened out and move on to our budgets. Tonight we have fire and recreation. Fire and recreation that will complete and we'll do recreation first. <laughs> Here's a bit of a drive home. All right. Recreation. That's under tab nine, I believe. Yep. Yeah.
Yes, it is. Yep. And you actually sent us an updated budget. I sent you an updated budget, um, made some changes. Um, what you're seeing here is, is uh, we, our recreation director position is full time. Uh, so that uh, increased our full, full time wages. In fact, it's the only full time wages uh, we have one person. Um, we, we, she has reduced her part time wages by 35,000. Um, and of course, this adds in benefits and some other things, but uh, so it, uh, she's added increased some of her uh, program costs. Um, and it's going to be an interesting. It's going to be an interesting year uh, to see all the things that, that this group is planning. So uh, not much uh, else. Uh, we've got two people that she's working with that uh, were here before. Um, so we're getting, she's got some history with some people um, and um, not much else I can tell you. She, uh, we've increased the, um, I think, uh, one of the hobbit, one of the parades so hopefully we are, fall back into our regular routine of halloween and um the holiday parade we'll see how that goes with the pandemic <laughs> <laughs> yeah crap shoot but um that's where all there is really to it she's very very busy and we're very very excited and so is she and, and as you can see, and so was Jeremy. So, so is, um, <laughs> any so, questions of? I guess going to offer Angela anything you'd like to say, Angela? No, I'm good. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Any questions from the board? So we're looking at. Quite a large increase, but as Steve said, a lot of that has to do with going to a full-time position now. Um, is uh, <clears throat> a lot of a lot of things got you know bumped up because of that. But is hopefully is uh, I'm hearing a lot of good things lot of all good all, things. all around a lot town. Of good things a lot all of around town that uh, people involved that haven't been involved. She's talking to the schools, which. I always found a little bit difficult to break into when it comes to participating and using sites, but I have confidence that things are going to change. So I'm excited. Thank you, Steve. If there are no questions, we'll move on to the fire department. Yep. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Thank you. Tab number seven. The fire. As all, like all our public safety, most every budget this year, um, not a lot of uh, meat in it this year. It's mostly wages, basic budgets. Um, increases, are, most of it comes from uh, the union contract and wages. Um, there were some, some requests for some extra bodies, but I asked everybody to hold off this year. I know it's a, for public safety, it's very difficult, but um, didn't get much pushback. Everybody recognizes where we are with this pandemic and, and un, the unknowns of what we're going to see. But um, I appreciate staff um, doing that. So we have, when you look at the budget, it's really a small increase, 2.6%. Uh, um, that's actually less than what the wages increase was. So. Um, uh, hopefully 22, 23 will be a different year. And uh, uh, we've done well the last five years, the last six budgets. So this is, um, and Dennis is here. If anybody has any questions with, of Chief Plant, um, you can ask the way. But... Any, any, any questions, comments? I'll just say that I'm, surpri I'm surprised with uh, the small increase is with the new station and the expenses that would go with that. I was expecting more. Yeah. But, um, uh, we, I think we'll have a better idea. Well, I, 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 the 
The lighting is all LED, like we saw here in all of our other buildings. Uh, that's dropped our costs. Um, and uh, heating costs, I think, will probably be the greatest because we're just heating a lot larger building. But overall, there shouldn't be much maintenance to it. So right. at least for the next 10 years, we hope. Um, but Anything you'd like to add, Chief Plant? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say uh, I think, uh, you know, 2020 has been a difficult year, an exciting year for the fire department, mainly because of the new station. Uh, uh, I still have people on the on-call force that haven't been to the station, of course, because of the uh, virus uh, status, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, a lot of our training that we usually plan on a yearly basis have had to have been uh, postponed, uh, but I, I have to say that the new station is working out well. I don't have to, I want to say, because it is. Uh, it's so big, uh, we're having trouble keeping it clean, but we're managing. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the, the other thing that I think I know the board and the townspeople understand that with the virus going on and, and uh, for almost a year now, it's, it's, it's putting a toll on staffing. And uh, whether they're EMTs or not, our policies and the way we used to do things uh, have totally changed. And it, it presents some uh, major concerns. Uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, we had, or I had requested a uh, extra uh, per diem position this year. Uh, but also being a taxpayer and understanding the state of the town at this point, understand why that's not going to go through. But I would highly recommend in the future that the board really give that some consideration because uh, we're being affected pretty good at this point. But overall, I appreciate the board's support, appreciate the taxpayers' support, and I look forward to next year. Any questions of the chief? Uh, doesn't appear to be. Um, is uh, yeah, you know, is, is the the personnel problems? You know, is it was hard enough in the the good times to get all the men you needed. So I can imagine now it must be even tougher. Is um, so. Is uh, anything you'd like to add, Mr. Town Manager? I, I think uh, some of the things that we're seeing in Berwick. Um, and what we're expecting and what outside groups are expecting is that Berwick is changing. Berwick is growing um, and people on the outside looking in are seeing changes coming. Uh, so I hope we can get through this pandemic and focus on uh, our, especially our public safety uh, people, uh, make sure they have the need, people and needs they have. Um, we've got, We've got great departments and uh, want to make sure we're uh, giving them the tools to do the job. So. If there are no further questions for the town manager or the chief, is, uh, we'll close that budget out. Um, Steve, one thing we haven't talked about is any capital improvements. There are none. Mm -hmm. um, the only uh, capital improvements that we funded this year was the 600,000 for roads. Um, we didn't fund, uh, we funded the, uh, the um, patrol car the this patrol year, car, the but that was a little bit easier this year. Because unfortunately we totaled one. And uh, so the cost is a little bit easier. Uh, we only, we're gonna replace only one this year anyway. Um, and I did put more money into the public works budget, 15,000 more. Um, the uh, people from uh, HP Fair Fairfield are coming out tomorrow to talk to Public Works, to look at the stainless steel body, which should go right onto the new body if we fund that. Um, but we have time to think more about that. Um, we're going to lose a truck. Right. Yeah, pretty sure of that. Um, otherwise, um, nothing else was really funded this year. You know, we have some work to do on this building. We have sewer. Um, pipe issues on the ground that yeah <laughs> but hopefully Lena Clark's funding can will take care of that uh, cost 
Um, but otherwise, this building is in pretty good shape, and most of our buildings are now. Okay. So Public Works could use some, a few things, but we've managed with it this long. We'll manage it with it without doing anything. So, um, but yeah, we're not we're not funding stuff this year. We're not good. using funding from our own assigned fund balance. We uh, you have a policy in place. We are able to keep what we what we need to get through the year. Um, and I, I really, Lisa and I did not want to tap that fund at right. all this year. Well, you hit it pretty hard last year. Yeah, we hit it pretty hard last year. So. This year, it really depends on what the school does. And I, and I don't think they're into their process very deep. Uh, but uh, so right now we're looking at less than 50 cents. If they were to grow by 5%, um, I, if they can grow less than that, that would be really good. But I don't know what's going on with the school system and their funding from the state right. and how that's going to work. Right. So still a, too early to tell. Um, so uh, this is a short, this is a short budget and it will hopefully go by quickly and we'll be through the pandemic and things will return to whatever the new normal is. Right. Any questions? Any questions, comments? If not, is I will close out our budget workshop. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it.